Hello and welcome to our webinar, Machining of Drug Hubs. My name is Martin Abendschein. I'm at AMAC the responsible application team manager for all strategic parts for the chassis, which means hubs, but also drums and discs, and also all chassis related parts. With me is my colleague, Mr. Jan Gotthold. Thank you, Martin. Also from my side, a warm welcome to our webinar. My name is Jan Gotthold. I am product manager at business unit automation and robotics. I'm here today to figure out for you um, that IMAG is not only your strong partner regarding machining since decades, we also offer to you a great experience on uh, automation and interlinking processes. Regarding this webinar, um, it would be nice to get in touch with you. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to use the question functionality of the, which, you have seen, uh, which you see on the screen. So far from my side, and I think we can start. Martin, the stage is yours. Okay, thanks, Jan. So first of all, I want to give you a short introduction about different types of hubs. We do have hubs for personal cars and also hubs for trucks or agricultural uh, use and so on. Today, we don't want to touch the personal cars. This is another application. So our webinar today is focused just on the machining and on the processes for the big hubs, like you can see here also on our small example, which is a typical hub with an OD of 385 millimeters. So today we are talking just about these processes. If we have a close look now to the parts which are normally uh, inside a complete axle system, and here we are talking about the driven axles, the non-driven axles, also for the trailer axles. So we do have normally the hubs itself in different variations. Then we do have the brake discs or the friction rings for the mounted ones, and we do have the brake drums. All of these parts we can handle in our system, we can machine on our machines. But today we are focused on the hubs. If we now have a close look to the process chain of the machining for such hubs, we can divide one time is the mechanical machining and then we have the follow-up processes. So regarding the mechanical machining, we start with the raw part handling after the casting process, then we have the mechanical machining of the part of the hub, and after that, measuring, marking, and finished part handling. After that, the follow-up process starts again with the part handling. Then we do have the painting and coating system, the cleaning and conservation. And also here for the cleaning, we do have our own solution with our experts from EMAC Laser Tech in Heubach, so that we also can clean by laser cleaning the bearing seats for the bearings in the inner diam uh, diameters of the hubs. So also here we do have solutions which we can provide to you for the complete process. After that, either we do have the packing or in case that the hub will directly be assembled to the axle, also the uh, assembling then and the part handling at the end. So now the machining process itself. Typically we do have three setups to machine the part. First setup is OP10, so we are turning the first side, raft turning, finish turning of some of the areas already. Then we swivel the part by 180 degrees, bring the part to the second spindle, there we are doing the raft turning of the second side, finish turning of some areas, and if it is required also from the process and from the customer, we, we also can do already the drilling process there. And then in the first, uh, in the third setup, we are doing the fine turning, especially of the bearing diameters inside and all geometrical related areas, which have to be in the same tolerances and in the same base as the inner diameters. Also here we can do the drilling process if it's necessary. Um, it's always a question of philosophy if we should do the drilling process on our turning machines or if the customer later on wants to use a machining center to do all the drilling processes there. We can handle both, we can also provide both. And at the end, we do then have also here 
with the marking and the measuring processes, follow-up processes, which we can handle inside our complete line. Now a closer look to the first setup. This is now OP10 here, typically. We are clamping on the OD. We are doing the wharf cutting of the first areas, sometimes also the finish cutting. And here we are using our turning machines with normally a turret with 12 magazine places for the turning, uh, but also with driven tools if necessary for the drilling operations. Here in a cycle time of 120 seconds. After turning the part by 180 degrees, we are doing now the second operation. Here also by use of a free charge clamping on the OD, also the same machine type, also again 12 tools on the turret, and here we do have a cycle time of 115 seconds. And at the end, for the finish and fine turning process, we are using a collar chuck and doing also here the inner diameter, especially here, these two bearing diameters together, as well as here the face sides and sometimes some ODs as well. And here in 102 seconds. This process is now without a drilling process because this customer requirement was that the drilling process should be done then later on on a machining center. If we are now talking about our machine concepts, about our automation concepts, we can start with the, let's say, easiest one. That's out of our modular standard product type. We have the VL8 machine type, which is itself a standalone machine, which has, of course, as all of our EMAC machines, the pickup principle. This means the machine loads and loads the part by itself. Here, in combination with a track motion system. A track motion system is a gantry on one meter height, which brings the part through the complete process and has also the availability to swivel the part by 180 degrees so that we can easily combine the machines with this track motion to have a very modular concept for the complete production line. In case that we have to add additional periphery or in case that there are some other requirements for the layouts and so on, we of course can also use other automation systems. And now my colleague Jan will show you one of these more complex systems. Thank you, Martin. Um, but we already have the first question which I would like to answer at this point. Um, is the control of the automation realized via the machine control? Um, this cannot be answered only with one sentence. Um, if we have two operations, if we have two machines um, and they are interlinked with a um, track motion system, yes, they can be controlled by the machine. If there are three machines, um, the track motion system has its own control, but they communicate with each other. Of course they do. Uh, in case of more, um, of bigger automation solutions, more co complex au automation solutions. Um, they have their own control as well, just to be more flexible. But of course, there are interfaces to um, make um, a, um, make a, them talk to each other possible. I hope uh, this was um, this answer is question. Uh, this uh, question is answered so far. Um, as Martin already said, uh, I would like to show you a little bit more about uh, other options of automation. Uh, again, we see here three uh, VL8 machines, um, which have been um, interlinked with the track motion system like we saw before. In this case, um, the shuttles of the machines are rectangular to the orientation of the interlinking. That means the pick and place positions are not anymore in one straight line. So this is not, mo not any more comfortable for a track motion system or for any other uh, gantry system. It's more comfortable to use a uh, robot in this case. We also have blow box in here. We have laser marking in here and we need different orientations of the workpiece during this process. So uh, it's great to have the flexibility of an uh, industrial robot. In addition, this line is not only for hub um, production. Um, on the video which we see now, um, you can see that there are also disc, discs produ uh, in production. Right now we see the Unloading of the OP10, the part is re uh, to provide it to OP20. 
the robot moves to the next machine on the external axis and here you can see that the gripping positions are not in one straight line uh, as I mentioned already before. After OP20 we're gonna load the blow box for cleaning the parts and you see as well we need a different orientation of the part for loading and unloading the laser marking system. After laser marking the part is fitted out of this um, line on an external conveyor again for next operations. On this slide we see another uh, solution of automation. Um, on the left hand side you see the loading of the robot works uh, on pellets via forklift. The position of the parts on the um, pellets are given by an optical system so the robot can pick them up directly from the pellets. The robot itself is loading the conveyor which is interlinking our three operations. Our machines are designed like that, that they have an internal gantry that makes them possible to pick up the parts directly from the conveyor and load the spindle itself. After operation 20, 30, uh, we feed into a uh, robot work cell again. Here you can see we have integrated an external measuring machine um, to have an end of line um, test of the complete process. Afterwards, the parts are pelletized again on pellets and can be feed out by a forklift again. So far to the automation concept of this line, uh, Martin will give you some more information about the production process. Thanks. Okay, so now coming a little bit closer to the machine area. So as I mentioned before, it's always a question of philosophy and application, which type of machine we are using. Here you see now a special application. Some of the hubs need to have a profile uh, outside on the OD, which have to be milled in this case. And here we do have special solutions with our VDZ machine type. There we do have one turret with 12 tool places for the normal turning process and drilling process. And on the other hand, we have the flexibility also to integrate a horizontal milling spindle with a tailstock in this way, where, which gives us also high rigidity for the complete process. And now it depends if we can finish the slot contour in one cut or if we have to rough cut it and finish cut it. And even then we could use a set milling tools so that we have one milling tool for the rough cutting and one milling tool for the finish cutting. So here we do have also the complete flexibility inside the machine areas to handle all the different types and kinds of applications. Thank you so far. We already have the next question uh, which I want to uh, give to you. Are there automation solutions for small batches? How do you bring flex flexibility into the process or into the machines? I think we both have, have an answer for it. I think, uh, should I start? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, so the automation, um, we are happy to have the robot. <laughs> Let's make it simple like that. Uh, the robot itself is a very, very flexible tool for part handling. So if pick and place positions change because we change the um, work pieces, this is no big issue for the robot because it's only a question of teaching new positions. In addition, we have to uh, take a look at uh, the feed-in concept, which is suitable for different parts. But this is a par uh, section where we can, uh, where we, you can use our, our uh, experience regarding this. Third of it, uh, the control has to know uh, which parts are fitted in and there are different po uh, possibilities as well. The simplest way is that the operator chooses it on the HMI. Uh, there are possibilities to ch change um, the, the setups for different parts. Another option, for example, can be that we have uh, RFID information on a carrier which is fitted into the machine and so uh, the machine gets this information about uh, from on this way. So far from automation side. <laughs> okay, thanks. Some more information. So <laughs> regarding the machine side, of course we have also to take care about the flexibility of the machines. It's always a question of philosophy um, of the requirement, but in general we do have a turret with 12 magazine places, which means we can handle this with VDI 50, VDI 60, with BMT, with CDI, or even with CAPTO. 
if you have to have a very flexible system with very slow uh, with very low setup times we normally choose the captor system so that you easily can change the complete tool holder out of the turret in case that you have to set up the machine to a next part type and in combination with an RFID chip on the tool holder so which makes it very simple to preset already the next batches of tools which you need for the next job in the machine beside of the machine to be ready and as soon as we start to set up the machine you just mechanically wise change the tools and take the new uh, tool in you read in the RFID uh, data which is normally the tool length for the diameters and so on and this data will be automatically transferred into the machine control into the tool database so that when you start after that the process all the tool data are already available on the other hand we have to think about the clamping uh, systems normally for op10 20 we are using three charge chucks six charge chucks whatever so here we can of course also use uh, let's say quick change systems to have an, an shortened setup time for change of the chores of the locators and so on sometimes if you have to change collets for the collet chucks that's a little bit more complex then here we do provide special equipment uh, which you can use to bring the old chuck or collet out and the new in on the other hand in case for the first part which we then after setup have to produce we have the possibility to use our internal touch probe which is located outside of the working area but directly beside of our pickup system and there with combination with our control cut system you just say okay now I have a new tool um, you start our um, control cut cycle in the in the program and then the machine is running we start with the new tool but there will be some stock on the diameter and on the length so we just turn a small area then we go outside to the touch probe we measure the diameter which was now turned we make a direct compensation in the tool database and then start again and finish the complete part without any manual change of the setup uh, in the in the database and to be sure that we have a good part already with the first part after that okay mm -hmm. so that's for my side for the machine and um, now we have an additional or a more much more complex automation system running now which Jan will show you thank you Martin and we are already got the next question but this will be um, answered within the next slides so um, I think um, do you um, also integrate third-party uh, machines yes of course we do uh, this is a good example for it um, what do we have here uh, you see in uh, CID layout and uh, concept layout in the very f early step of the project um, we have um, loading works out here in the beginning which picks uh, which is uh, unpalletizing the parts from the pallet and feed it to operation 10. operation 10 20 and 30 are interlinked by a track motion system afterwards we have to load an hardening machine op30 uh, which is not that comfortable to load with a uh, with a gantry so we use a robot here again afterwards we have a buffer con uh, conveyor buffer belt to separate the OP50 to the OP60. This makes it more flexible. OP60, this is uh, the question uh, which we had right now, are third party machines which our customer wanted to have in this line. So um, for us, it's no problem to integrate these machines. Um, we have to define uh, the interfaces, mechanical interface, electrical interface, and um, um, control interface. And within this we have all uh, information together if this is defined there's no big issue to uh, implement those machine to this complete line um, these machines the op60 uh, machines are loaded by a robot again on an external axis which is also possible or able to load the marking machine at the end of the line and palletizing the parts for feed them out of the complete um, line <coughs> um, as you see, this is um, 
longer, a more complex um, production line with different kinds, uh, with different combinations of automation solutions. Uh, in this case, we use the functionality of digital engineering, um, which provides us very good and reliable information to an early point in time during the project. For example, we can do uh, simulations like shown on this video. From there we get information about the accessibility, cycle time, handling times and buffer loads. For example, the cycle time of one single machine is very simple to calculate, even if you have an uh, automation solution. But in this case, we have many, many different cycle times. Cycle times of the machines, cycle time of the robots, cycle time of the gantries, um, of the conveyor belt, many, many different cycle times which influence each other. So it's very hard to get the information out of the complete process. That's why we do this kind of simulations. You see here the single operations, operation 10 to 60. You see the working times. You see the, the times that the machines are waiting for loading and unloading. And you see that the machines are blocked for loading and unloading. And this is a very interesting because these times are inf have an influence on each other. So within the simulation we get the complete information about the OEE of the complete line. And another nice benefit is that we have the possibility um, to uh, set uh, to uh, implement setup, setup times or availability of machines. If a machine is broken or if there is any uh, work which an operator has to do, this can be simulated as well. So the information about the OEs is very reliable to an early state in the project. Afterwards, um, during the project, we are also able to do. Um, um, virtual commissioning of a project like that. That means um, we test our software on a digital twin before we get on the machine. That means the software is even debugged even on a higher level than we, um, because we already had the possibility to check them um, on the digital twin. This, the big benefit of that is that um, we can decrease the commissioning time at your site um, and we can uh, speed up during the ramp, ramp up of the production. So far from my side uh, regarding this automation, so I give the word mm -hmm. back to Martin. Thanks. Uh, maybe in addition to the already answered question, if we could also implement third party machines, of course, but uh, we have to see also the complete system in that case. This means also for the CE declaration, EMAC will be your contact and EMAC will be responsible even in case that we have to deliver third party machines inside the complete automation system. This means we are responsible to make the complete CE declaration for the complete line, including all machines, all equipments which are inside these lines. That's also very important. Thank you, Martin, for this. Uh, additional information and we already have the next question. Okay. Um, before we continue with our slides, I think um, we can take this time to answer this. Okay. Um, do you have uh, solutions for production monitoring? Uh, shall I, shall you? Um, I think we both can. Maybe you can start. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, good. Monitoring for production reasons. Yes, of course, we have solutions. Uh, the most simple one is just a part counter or time counter inside the control like it is as a standard. Um, but of course, we do have also in combination with our EMAC Aetna IoT, the possibility to install and complete uh, IoT core inside the e-cabinet, which then can uh, monitor, can collect all this data, like number of parts produced per shift, per hour, per day, per year, uh, number of downtimes, downtime, uh, number of tool changes, uh, times, and so on. Um, and also, of course, in combination with some sensors, which are then assembled in the machine for the main components, like the main spindle in the turret and so on, which we can use later on for overall maintenance issues, which means for preventive maintenance reasons that we can monitor and see also when the bore screw is going down in the lifetime and so on. Uh, but coming back to the production monitoring, of course, we can do that. Um, on the other hand, we have to consider always the strict uh, regulations by law and also by the unions. So sometimes we can collect the data, 
we can monitor it, but it's not allowed to send them out to our customers or uh, to send all out of them because it's, it could be very easy to check then and to monitor is the operator working really eight hours per day or is he sleeping two, day, uh, two hours and the machine is doing nothing in that time. And there are some regulations which you have to consider. We can do it, but we always have to be in close contact with our customers and also our customers need to know the regulation, what is allowed and what is not allowed. But in general, we can do it and we can then give out all the data which are really uh, allowed by law, by the unions, to monitor this production. Uh, the automation, uh, we have the same situation. We also can uh, monitor uh, some interesting uh, production data, uh, for example, the cycle time of the robot, uh, not okay uh, parts and stuff like that. Um, the cycle time is more is very interesting because sometimes you can see um, the robot is waiting maybe a, a very long time for the machines to uh, load and unload them. In this case, uh, this might be an interesting point to integrate uh, additional functionalities to the um, um, robot work cell like we showed before, like um, deburring, maybe uh, like blowing or like laser marking. So the um, process information about the robot work cell is as interesting as well. The story so far, I think we can switch to the next slide. Okay, good. Um, so now, first we saw our solutions for the automation concepts. I spoke already a little bit about the different machine types. So now here you see the different machine types which we can use for that. First of all, we have our standalone solution, VL8 machine type. All of our machines are pickup machines. This means this standalone machine as well as all the others can directly load and unload the workpiece by itself. In this combination with an enclosed O conveyor, the operator just have to put in the raw part and take out the finished part after the OP 10 or 20 or 30. That's the most simple way. Or then, of course, in combination with our track motion with robot systems as a complete production cell. On the other hand, as soon as we have to implement additional applications into the machine, like milling, like multiple drilling heads or something like that, um, we normally choose our VSC or VDZ machine types, which have more possibilities to integrate more applications. And also in case if there are customer requirements, customer specifications, which we do have to fulfill, which we cannot fulfill out of our modular range of scope with the VL8. In this case, we choose the VSC or the VDZ type. It's always also a matter of philosophy. And here we are already in the quotation in the inquiry phase in a close contact with the customers and we listen about the preferences of our customers, to the preferences of our customers. For example, if one customer has already since decades VSC machine types in use, then of course we will go with the new project with the same machine type. Or it's a matter of the area which we can uh, later on use for the complete production cell. If we have an area which is very wide, but in the depth it's limited, then normally we are choosing the VD set machine type because these machines uh, have a very small footprint uh, in the depth, but they are a little bit more in the wide. So we can choose out of our range of products the most suitable, the best fitting solution for this kind of application request. Then. Okay. So that's about the machines themselves. Here again, you see some applications which we did already. First, the milling process, as I showed before in our movie. Then the drilling process, either directly on the turret by use of driven tools, or here also with uh, additional milling spindles, drilling spindles in the working area. So we are very flexible there for all kinds of applications. Thank you, Martin. We have a next question, which I want to put here. How much does the, does the high chip volumes influence the quality of the thermal behavior of the machine? How is the temperature compensation done? Long-term accuracy of the machines? I think this is up to you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question. And maybe I have to go back to, one, uh, to this slide. So as I mentioned before, all of our machines are pickup machines. This means 
The workpiece is hanging on the main spindle and the turret is below. So during the machining process, the chips can easily fall down directly into the chip conveyor and be moved out of the machine. So most of the temperature of the heat comes with the chips. So we take the chips out, that's the first part, which helps us to stabilize the complete process regarding temperatures. Second is we are using coolant. So also with the coolant, we cool down the part, the tool and the chips and flash them out, which helps us again. On the other hand, of course, we have some um, equipment inside the machine. So for instance, in the VSC machine type, we are using a two circuit uh, cooling system for the main component. So we are cooling down the machine bed the turret as well as the main spindle and the second one is just for the e-cabinet. Or we are using somehow sensors to check the temperature inside and the movement of the machines. So here we have also different possibilities, different types of machines which we can use and it's always up to you and to the request in accuracy what we have to achieve, which machine type we then can use out of our range of products. Thank you very much. Okay. Good. So, then coming back to this slide now, and now we just want to summarize our advantages and your benefits out of what we could provide to you in case that we are working together, if we get your orders, if you, get, uh, if you send us your requirements. So first of all, you will have a cooperation with the market and technology leader in case of hub productions. EMAC is known since decades to have the right machines, the best solutions for this kind of applications. Then the second one is we have a big background team in the quotation process which is doing the process, makes the cycle times, make the process layouts and so on. And in case that we get the order, we hand this over directly to our project management team and also there we do have very experienced project managers which will handle the project, which will take care about the complete project. And now there comes one more very strong point for the EMAC. EMAC has a complete worldwide uh, group. So this means our project management in Germany can handle the complete process chain with all the automation components, with all third parties as one face to the customer to you. This means you have one contact person inside the EMA group, first during the quotation process, so it's the technical sales, and then after that it's our project management. Always one contact for you, regardless if you have questions according third machine uh, third party machines according automation, according the machine or the process itself has one contact to you and this project manager will then spread your inquiry inside the EMA group to the suppliers, collect all the answers and give it back to you. And this helps you to avoid two big capacities in your own company, which means your project management team can be less or these guys can do other tasks because you have one contact at EMAC which takes care about the complete line, so you don't have to take care about the automation from this supplier, the machine from that supplier, the tooling from that supplier and so on. This is done completely by EMAC. And as I mentioned before, EMAC is a worldwide operating group which helps you also worldwide. This means if your headquarters is in Germany and you have a pilot project here in Germany, for a new type of application for, for hubs in that case, then our experts from EMAC here in Salah will support you for this pilot project. But later on, if you want to roll it out to another facility in let's say China or in America or in India, our experts there in China, in the US, in Mexico, in India, worldwide, are also standing beside you and help you for this project. And of course, there will be a complete data transfer from Germany to our facilities, subsidiaries there. So that you will have the same quality in expertise, in the machines, in the application as we have here in Germany. Okay, at this point, that's the complete summarize uh, of the webinar. Thank you very much and 
Jan and me are now very open for all of your questions, which hopefully will come now. <laughs> exactly, we don't have to wait very long. We have okay. the next one already on the screen. Um, how do machining concepts differ between trucks, in brackets, large uh, series, and for example, tractors, small and medium series? <coughs> okay. Um, do you want to start with the automations first? Or? I can do. Okay. Um, so, um, again, um, automation. Um, from, from the root of some automation is a very flexible solution. So um, we have to uh, consider the feeding concept, we have to consider the gripping concept, but normally uh, there are easy ways um, to handle even small batches with the same um, automation solution. So you are flexible from side of automation. That means maybe you have to change the gripper if the parts getting smaller or bigger. Maybe you have to change the carriers if you use carriers. Maybe you have to teach some different positions, um, some new positions. But all in all, the effort for putting new products um, on the machine is no big effort for from point of automation. Okay, so from the machine side, as I mentioned before, we can use uh, quick change systems for the toolings, like captor systems, also for the chucks uh, and so on. So also here we do have the flexibility. And of course, it depends always on the requirement. For, for big lot sizes, like typical in OEM business, uh, we are using a complete cell, a line, and the machines which are then focused on high efficiency on high product volumes. On the other hand, if you are talking about after sales market where we have typically smaller lot sizes and high variations in the part, then we have to look how many tools, for example, we can use for all or for the most of the, of the parts, which means then maybe we don't have special toolings with two, with three inserts per tool, then maybe we are using only one or maximum two inserts per tool, but these tools will then be designed according to the best fitting variation of the parts. And, and this is also a very important point, um, even already during the quotation phase, um, we are starting to make a setup analysis, which means if you give us 10 different part types, we check, okay, which parts could fit together with the clamping jaws, with the toolings and so on. And then we make already an, an let's say, a data sheet out of that so that you can see later on, okay, if I have to change from part number A to part number B, you would need, let's say, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. If you have to change from part number A to C because it's completely different, maybe you would need two hours. So you get already some data sheets in hand which you can use then later on for your calculation, for your uh, ROI calculation, um, which helps you to see if everything fits together or not. Fine, thank you very much. And the next question, um, can I answer by myself? <laughs> which robots do you use? Um, yeah, we have um, two different types of uh, robots as standard. We uh, mostly uh, we work with KUKA and with FANUC as standard. Why do we use them? Uh, they are worldwide um, uh, active uh, and available with their services and they are uh, very um, reliable machines. So that's why we use them as a standard. But uh, often we are faced with the situation that you as our customer um, have already robots running and of course we are open um, to the products that, that you have already on your site. For example, um, an ABB or something like that. So we are uh, flexible and at this point. Okay. Um, next question regarding automation. Uh, when does track motion come into play and when um, does a robot? Yeah, we tried to figure it out um, in this, um, uh, we tried to figure it out before. Um, track motion is uh, very nice solution, a very simple uh, and space saving solution if you have up to three operations um, in one line. Then we have um, a very compact uh, solution um, which is very is also very flexible regarding additional processes. If you are able to uh, put all the uh, process and all the picking position, position, this is very important, all the picking positions have to be in one straight line. 
If this is not possible, uh, robot is getting more interesting because you are more flexible regarding the layout. You can arrange the machines not only in li one line, you can handle them in any different. If you put it to an L, if you put it to an U, if you have it on the one side, on the other side, robot in the middle, this is even the more flexible solution. And even the integration of additional functionality can be done easy, more easily with the robot. Okay, so we have a very interested audience. <laughs> Thank you for all the questions. Okay. Um, are there also <coughs> machining concepts for other components than those shown here? <laughs> okay, um, yes, of course there are. <laughs> uh, but the webinar today is just for the truck hubs. Uh, but as I mentioned during the introduction phase already, of course we can also do, beside of the hubs, uh, all kind of discs, all kind of drums. Um, we do have other webinars where you can then see all kind of different applications like wing gears, like diff cases. Um, so IMAC is a group and maybe you can see it here on, on our screen as well. Uh, we are not only doing turning. So we are doing turning, of course, that's our main business for shafts and chuck parts, but also we are doing milling processes, gear hopping processes, even uh, dry gear grinding processes. We are doing cylindrical and non-cylindrical grinding. We are doing ECM, PSM and laser processing. This means we have a lot of applications which we can do, of course, also as single machines, but also complete client machines. And you are warmly welcome to visit our homepage and just look on YouTube, for example. Uh, if you are looking for, let's say, diff cases, just type in diff case in the search and you will see that we are also providing some webinars for this especially. So of course we can do also other parts. Thank you, Martin, again. Um, <coughs> I think this is all for today regarding the questions, okay. but uh, don't be afraid if you, sometimes it's like that, if you, the questions come afterwards, but uh, we are open uh, for that. You can send us uh, to us via email. Uh, the contact is shown here. Um, we are interested in your feedback regarding uh, this uh, uh, webinar. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us afterwards. Many thanks from my side. I wish you the best. Also, thank you very much from my side and it was a pleasure for us to show you all our applications today and we are really looking forward to your questions. Hopefully there will be some more after you um, have, have checked everything and send us your requirements. We are completely open for your requirements as well and thank you very much again from my side and all the best for the future. <laughs>